And now, the Chesterton Academy of St. George, in collaboration with Good Shepherd Catholic Radio, presents Two Masters of Theology, with Joseph Gruber and Matthew Addison, having timeless conversations about timeless truths of the faith. Welcome to Two Masters of Theology. I am Joseph Gruber. And I am Matthew Anderson. How are you today, Matthew? Good. It's good to be back with you, Joseph. Always good to be with you, Matthew. (laughs) And good to be with you, all of our listeners. Thank you so much for tuning in. As we have a fun show, I think we could say today, don't you say, Joseph? Yes. Yes, I do. A fun one, right? We're going to be talking about uh, a topic that actually a listener out there in Radio Land called in. Uh, and asked us about and suggested that we talk about it today. Uh, and we're going to be talking about uh, God and trickiness. Is that how we should say it? Trickiness? Yeah. I, I, do you have a better word? I don't <laughs> I don't think so, right? Then that is the best word. The notion of, of trickster uh, uh, in religion. So before we get to that, Joseph, why don't we pray? I have no reason not to. <laughs> in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Direct, O Lord, our actions by thy holy inspiration, and carry them on by thy gracious assistance, that every word and work of ours may begin in thee, and by thee be happily ended. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Joseph. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, indeed, this idea of trickiness, what we're calling the trickiness of God, uh, is our discussion today. There might be some disagreement about this, I feel like, Joseph. We're definitely kind of in speculative theology land, don't you think? That's an appropriate place for us, I think. <laughs> That's, this is where to do speculative theology in front of all of our radio listeners. <laughs> right. So I guess, yeah, I guess we should have a, a little caveat at the beginning of the show here that we submit everything that we say to the magisterium uh, of the church. And if we are corrected uh, by the magisterial teaching authority of the church, we will gladly change what we say on, on air. Mm-hmm. At least I'm going to say that. I don't know. I've literally taken an oath of fidelity to the magisterium <laughs> more times than I can count. <laughs> All right. Good. Good. So this topic uh, came up from one of our listeners uh, who called in with a question, uh, in particular kind of relating to pagan mythology. Uh, he was thinking about different characters uh, in literature. He had recently seen... Uh, actually, Susical the Musical, uh, which stars the cat in the hat, which is, of course, a, a famous uh, trickster in his own right. And it got him thinking about how in many different types of mythology, you have this notion of a god who is a trickster. Uh, and so, you know, for instance, the famous one that comes to mind is in, in Norse theology. Uh, he was thinking of Loki. You know, mm-hmm. in, in Greek theology, uh, you have Hermes, you know, and then the, the counterpart in Roman mythology of, of Mercury. Uh, these are all kind of gods who are, are tricksters. And yet, when we think about Christianity, is there room for that? Is, is, is you know, his, his exact question was, you know, is there any figure similar to that in Christianity? Uh, that kind of this this trickster god who does everything, but then somehow kind of brings about the the opposite of what he's trying to to trick people into, um, or is that something that's that's purely pagan? Because his point was, it seems so universal across many different mythologies that there's some element of truth that the pagan mind seems to be getting at. Uh, and so that was the question that we were presented with, and I thought it was a good question. And we started talking about it before we got on air, and then said, "Oh, we should we should be talking about this on air." Uh, so, Joseph, what are what are your kind of initial thoughts in hearing that question? Well, fortunately for you, I recently reread a collection of Norse mythology, so I'm much more familiar with the activity of Loki than you might expect. <laughs> Good, I know. You were you were surprisingly versed on it. Right. Like knowing about the children of Loki being Fenris the wolf and Jorgen Munder, the world serpent, whose coils wrap around the world and will destroy it. 
and Fenris the wolf who will devour the sun and the moon during Ragnarok. Yes, I know much. <laughs> so, so what do you think? Do you not see Loki as kind of a benevolent trickster? No, he he's horrible. He <laughs> <laughs> he arranges for the murder of people. His children destroy. Uh, he's accepted, but it's not really clear why. Right uh, in in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Loki is an adopted frost giant. You know, he is found on the field of battle. Uh, son of the king of the frost giants, Lofi, and adopted into the halls of Asgard as a son of Odin, which is not the story from Norse mythology. In Norse mythology, he has some relationship with Odin, but more like a blood brother. And he, he's part of the people of Asgard. He's part of the uh, their court, but he's not one of the Asir. He's not one of the uh, the Norse gods, per se. He's just among them. But his identity is is kind of veiled. Nobody's really sure why he's there. So do you have any idea? I mean, how did the Norse people treat Loki if, if he wasn't one of the gods? I mean, you know, did they treat him as kind of the enemy? Uh, is no, that... because he, he was charming and he was winsome and uh, he was a shapeshifter. This is a big thing. Right, he takes the form, uh, and sometimes his tricks—he'll trick anything that seems to be of interest. So, if there's another frost giant around, he'll trick that frost giant. Uh, but he's just as likely to, you know, steal the hair of the wife of Thor, and then, uh, you know, because he has to find a replacement wig for her, also ends up being the impetus for the creation of Thor's hammer. Right, so good does come from it, but he's unrepentant, and he's more tricking and then continuing to do tricks in order to get out of punishment, which he doesn't ultimately end up. Uh, his punishment until the end of time is to be chained down with a venomous snake dripping poison into his face and his uh, poor wife holding a bowl over his face so that it wouldn't drip but every time it's full, she moves it, so his face burns again. And that happens until uh, the earth quakes so hard that all bonds are broken. Okay, so what do you see? Do you see any similarity between him and Christianity? I, so I'm going to, to make the case, Matt, that he's a stand-in for the unrepentant heart. You know, our desire to sin and to sin again and to get out of our punishment by more sinning. That's going to be my contention. I know you have a different one because we began our discussion with your claim, which we can get to later. But I think the idea of a trickster God is uh, less about, oh, here's Satan, who is the deceiver. Because Satan seems to be pure evil. Like, the, that's at Loki... Yeah, because I was going to say that, you know, the devil seems to be more intentional than than the trickster god that, that you're talking about, right? Like, it seems like Loki is reacting right. a lot more, right? He tricks, he gets himself into a situation. Oh, I need to get myself out of this situation. I'm going to react again, you know? Whereas as the devil almost seems to be more... No, I I have a purpose. The purpose is is illogical. The purpose is just sheer destruction. <laughs> but that's what I am pursuing consistently, right? I am pursuing destruction consistently. Whereas whereas there does seem to be almost an element of ignorance in ignorance. the ignorance of the, the trickster god. And and certainly there are moments of pity for him, right? Like, oh, you you got yourself into a much bigger mess than you expected. Oh, dear. Uh, and there's this, like, falling at the pit of your stomach, reading along or hearing the story told, being like, oh, no, Loki did something much worse than he had intended. Uh, by the end of the, the cycle of stories with Loki, uh, he ends up becoming uh, much more uh, vengeful. But along the way, you're like, oh, th there, there's pity here. It seems to be more the, the journey of the unrepentant sinner who who will face final judgment. That's what I'm going to claim. Like that's that's where in Christianity Loki 
and and the whole trickster god kind of idea uh, takes on just human proportions as fallen man who who refuses to to accept grace and who who just so almost more of a cautionary tale then yeah yeah right do you think do you think the Norse viewed Loki as a cautionary tale? I think he was part of the. Uh, I guess, uh, the, yeah, cautionary in the sense of we know there are people out there who will do things randomly that are bad, that are trick, that are deceitful, and we also know they might not actually repent. You know, I mean, almost the way that you know we take a a, a more modern fairy tale like the boy that cried wolf. Right, like the boy that cried wolf is is clearly a cautionary tale, right? Like we don't we don't uh, uh, look at the boy that cried wolf and say, ah, there's something that I can emulate, right? Crying wolf over and over again. Um, but was Loki, and so I can see how Loki could be a cautionary tale, but I don't know. I mean, I feel like between Loki and Hermes, there was also this this aspect of, ooh, this is something to emulate. His trickiness is actually something that's admirable. Yeah, there there may have been some stories where you would say, "Oh, I wish I could get away with that," but I don't know. I mean, I don't it kind know, of Matt. makes me think of of uh, our Lord's story of the dishonest steward, which is a a surprising story in itself in the gospel, right? Where where you have this story of the dishonest steward who who goes and as he's getting fired rewrites the debts of right. all of his master's debtors uh, and then our lord kind of points to this man uh, and says that his disciples should be like him in a certain way yeah so there there is this this tension like when christ says to be as wise as serpents and is it as innocent as doves where there there is something about knowing how to move in the world without ever becoming of the world. But this is this is where when we when they throw up the image of Loki, he's taken to an extreme, right? And mm-hmm. the extreme is you, you don't want to emulate the extreme. You want to say, is there something there that might be worth emulating? And how so? All right. And that's what I think I want to want to explore after the break, right? I mean, we're at the point, we need to take a a bit of a break here, right? So when we come back from this word from our sponsors, we'll we'll dive into, is there there anything we can emulate in the trickiness? No, I want to go into what you think is the Christian corollary. Well, and that'll tie in. Okay, okay. (laughs) All right, we'll be right back. Two Masters of Theology, an exclusive Good Shepherd Catholic radio production, is made possible by the Chesterton Academy of St. George. The Chesterton Academy of St. George is an independent classical school in the Catholic tradition. The Academy seeks to raise up a new generation of joyful leaders and saints by forming young men and women in the rich intellectual tradition of the Catholic faith. The school introduces students grades 9 through 12 to the good, the true, and also the beautiful, by having them read such thinkers as Plato, St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, and Dante. For more information, their website could be found at castgeorge.com. Again, that's cast, C-A-S-T, george.com. Welcome back. This is Two Masters of Theology on Good Shepherd Catholic Radio here in Jackson, Michigan. I am Matthew Anderson. And I'm Joseph Gruber. And we are having conversations of consequence today. We are talking about trickiness and if there's anything admirable in it, if there's anything that kind of corresponds in Christianity to the trickiness that we often see in some of the old pagan myths such as Hermes and Loki. And before the break, uh, we were discussing especially Loki uh, because my colleague here, Joseph Gruber, uh, knows quite a bit about Loki. Also, uh, back in like fourth grade, I devoured like whole tomes of mythology, and I just assumed that everyone did this <laughs> around about age like nine or ten. And I, I check 
periodically with people and no they didn't they didn't right so it's good to kind of get into the the details of the story and actually use those details to construct a whole picture especially because the loki of the marvel cinematic universe is very different is very different right and so where we left off was talking about how loki is this symbol for the unrepentant sinner that's and, my case and, and the bad that comes from it and and so in that sense Loki can serve as a cautionary tale to us uh, to, to not constantly be trying to escape the consequences of our actions. Uh, but I'm going to, to kind of push and say that there is something good about trickiness that's being recognized in the pagan world uh, and that this does have a place within Christianity. Uh, so again, for those who might be be joining us, this this issue came up because a listener out there in Radio Land called us with this question, um, which means that if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out, and and we'd love to discuss them. Uh, and one of the things that occurred to me when when he asked this question was that there are times in the Christian tradition where God is described as being tricky, as being a bit of a trickster. Uh, and in particular, two things came to my mind. First, often the fathers of the church describe the salvation of Christ that Christ achieves, right? That the defeat of sin through the death on the cross and his subsequent resurrection as a kind of trickiness, uh, that there's this element that he tricked the devil. Uh, and they draw on this from a number of, of different sources. Um, in particular, they kind of tie this in and build off of this from the temptation in the desert uh, at the beginning of the Gospels, when it doesn't seem that the devil knows exactly who Jesus is and is kind of trying to figure out Jesus's identity. Uh, and so if the devil is ignorant of who Jesus is, uh, the fathers of the church said, hey, well, you know, when he dies on the cross, there's this kind of trick element to it, right? You know, the devil doesn't know who he's actually crucifying. And so he doesn't know what he's actually doing. He doesn't know that he's kind of signing his own defeat uh, by crucifying Christ, by, by implementing this crucifixion. Uh, and I think that's something you see in art sometimes. The example that comes to my mind um, is in The Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson, where he, ha he inserts that scene after the crucifixion where all of a sudden the devil is in hell it's kind of screaming out in pain, and you get this this idea of ooh, he's he's now he's realized that he's been defeated. He's realized what he's done. You do know that Mel Gibson is planning on making a Passion of the Christ two with Sequel. the actual harrowing of hell and and all of that. Oh, wonderful! No, yeah. I didn't know the harrowing of hell. I knew it was going to be about the resurrection, but I didn't know the harrowing of hell. I would think be it's it. going to have the harrowing of hell. Yeah, fantastic. I mean. If you were Mel Gibson and you had a chance to film The Harrowing of Hell, <laughs> I bet you would take that it. That would be cool. We haven't seen that on film. I can't think of a single film that has done that. No, I mean, the closest you get is that moment of the devil crying out uh, at the death of Christ mm -hmm. when he realizes he's been tricked. Mm -hmm. But other than that, that's the closest we get. Well, and that's kind of how the the fathers the fathers will describe what Christ does using the image of, of Jonah, mm -hmm. right? That he kind of makes himself the bait and he, and, he, and he allows himself to be swallowed up by death. He allows himself to be swallowed up by the forces of hell. But the forces of hell don't actually know who he is. And so when they, when they swallow him up, right, because of who he is, he's able to burst forth. Uh, and destroy the forces of hell, which apparently one version uh, of the tradition with Jonah said that when Jonah came up from the, the fish, uh, it killed the fish. 
uh, and actually destroyed the fish. Uh, and so there is the other tradition that Jonah doesn't survive within the belly of the beast, but he dies and then is revivified. And is revivified, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, what do you think of that interpretation of of this trickiness of God? I, I so that I think applies well. Who who is it we should be deceiving? Who is it we should be tricking? We should be bending our minds toward the frustration of the devil's plans, right? Like this, this seems like the proper outlet to, to laugh at the devil. Yeah. To, to allow God to make sport with him. Well, and, uh, our questioner in particular also pointed out that there's a long tradition of that, uh, within the stories of the church mm-hmm. of, of different saints, of different characters, tricking the devil at certain points, you oh, know. Yeah. I mean, I think of uh, Devil Went Down to Georgia. That that is looking a classic. to steal a soul, right? He gets tricked by a, a simple Georgia boy. Well, he was way behind because he was in a bind, <laughs> and he was he was looking to make a deal. We have to be careful of of when we uh, are going to be in copyright problems here. I I think we're in fair use <laughs> territory. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so yeah, so the the tricking of the devil that seems like a very important one. And yeah, like you said, there are many stories that are told, many classic fairy tales where the devil figures prominently and uh, is outfoxed, out-tricked by uh, the simple people, um, you know, these three brothers who make a deal with the devil. Um, But there is another aspect of God's trickiness that I wanted to point out that's Chestertonian Mm -hmm. that I think fits in well here. In his book, The Catholic Church and Conversion, he talks about these three stages in the life of a convert. Um, the first two stages make sense. One, you, you just start being fair to the church and to its claims and saying, well, I just want to get to know what the church really th- says about this. You know, I've seen stories, I've seen headlines, I've, I've read articles, but to hear from the church herself, what does the church believe? And I'll, I just want to know as a impartial observer. And then the next stage is to become fond of what the church teaches. And it's like, oh, there's actually something to this. There's something meatier here. There's something, uh, concepts that are enlivening, like, oh, this understanding of what sin is and what sin does and the difference between a mortal and a venial sin are things that Chesterton uh, points out especially. And these two make sense. Like there, there's an attraction to the faith once we start being fair to it because, uh, because it's true. But then he, he talks about this third stage in the life of a convert, and I think he's speaking particularly about himself, but probably about other people as well. And this third one is to be absolutely terrified about making the final step about becoming Catholic. And this is the stage where he says, um, it, is, it is not the Pope who has set the trap or the priests who have baited it. The whole point of the position is that the trap is simply the truth. The whole point is that the man himself has made his way towards the trap of truth and not the trap that has run after the man. This idea that God traps us because he's true uh, and, and we, kind of, we entrap ourselves in the truth. And kind of calls us, right, and that, that trap that you're talking about, right, that trickiness, he, he, he kind of calls us to something that's that's beyond us, right? He calls us you know, to not be comfortable. He calls us to, to, do, to do things that we would not expect to be able to do. You know, I think of um, our Lord calling Peter out of the boat to walk on water, right? Uh, or I think of um, the, the line from Jeremiah, you know, you duped me, Lord, and I let myself be duped. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think now an important aspect to that is that second part, Right, which you were kind of mentioning as well. I let myself be duped, right? Like the the trick didn't the trap didn't come for Chesterton, right? Like he drew close to the trap. So there's this element of, you know, yes, God can quote unquote trick us, but not really against our will. It's yeah. it's something we kind of actively cooperate in. We 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 know there's more than what our minds can comprehend. 
and, and we rush to that the same way that is kind of rushing towards us. Yeah, I, and I think this this goes at the heart of and any encounter with God has this element of surprise, this element of, I did not create this experience. I did not create this moment that that God has acted in a way that is unexpected. And, and therefore, I feel in some way, shape, or form, yeah, tricked. But tricked in a way that makes me more myself, frees me in a way that Loki doesn't free Right, except by accident. Right, and so it seems that the pagans are are on to something, mm-hmm. and yet are missing the fullness. Well, isn't that just the way of them? Huh? Wow, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> it always <laughs> happens that way. Uh, Man, it's it's like this whole Christianity thing comes from something that's beyond us. Right, but something that we long for. We we mm-hmm. want to be surprised. We're we want to for. be tricked. We we want to be taken out of ourselves uh, by activity that doesn't make sense to us right off the bat. Right. We want to be we want to be surprised, you know, the same way uh, a spouse sometimes wants to be surprised by the love of their spouse. Right. C.S. Lewis has his classic book, Surprised by Joy. Surprised by Joy. So, right. Well, Joseph, this has been, I think, a very fruitful uh, conversation. So thank you to our listener who uh, submitted this topic. We thoroughly enjoyed it discussing it. Until next time, know that you all are in our prayers. I am Matthew Anderson. And I'm Joseph Gruber. And we are the two masters of theology. God bless. You've been listening to Two Masters of Theology with Joseph Gruber and Matthew Anderson. A production of Chesterton Academy of St. George in collaboration with Good Shepherd Catholic Radio.